Welcome to Sophie and Co. I'm Sophie Shevard Natze. White supremacist movements are back in the headlines in the U.S. and my guest today knows all about it. He founded a hate group that grew into one of the biggest skinhead crews in the U.S. before renouncing the movement and now working to counter its message of hate. How do you contain the appeal of right-wing extreme? Well, I ask Arno Michelis, former skinhead, author of My Life After Hate. The political extreme is on the rise in the U.S., with far-right groups growing in number, emboldened by the fiery campaign rhetoric of President Donald Trump, provoking an uncompromising reaction from the left, with clashes between the two sides becoming ever more violent, is radicalism threatening to split America in two? Can the message of hate groups be effectively countered, or should it just be banned for good? Arno Michaelis, welcome to the show. Great to have you with us. Um, Arno, the recent White Lives Matter rally in Tennessee created a lot of hype. Police were on alert, people braced for brawls, bloodshed like the one in Charlottesville back in August. But white power protests were actually outnumbered by counter-protesters and bystanders. Are white supremacists going out of fashion, or is it just the calm before the storm? Uh, I think any type of uh, white supremacist rally that happens in the States, the, the white supremacists are going to be outnumbered. They're ready for that, and it actually helps to fuel their victimhood narrative that there's, they're, they're facing these extreme odds to... To fight for their people, so it, it the, whether they're outnumbered or not, uh, the attention they get is really what they're after. Well, at the same time, the number of hate groups have been on the rise in the U.S. for two years, with over 900 in total acting now in your country. That's according to the Southern Poverty Law Center. Another research suggests hate crimes rose up to 20 percent in 2016. Why is this happening? How do you explain the trend? I think uh, because of the current political climate where it's uh, not only acceptable but uh, being put into policy that immigrants are a threat, that Muslim people are a threat, it, it gives a carte blanche to uh, disgruntled white people in the United States to act out on those same sentiments which often results in actual violence and certainly fuels the rising membership of hate groups in the United States. Well, during the rallies in Charlottesville back in August, white supremacists were eagerly, you know, talking up their support for Trump. Um, does he make them feel emboldened? Is this related? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, since before the campaign, uh, white supremacist groups in the United States have been huge supporters of Trump. They uh, feel they have an ally in the White House. The, his anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim rhetoric, uh, at times anti-gay uh, rhetoric, is really the same talking points that groups like the Ku Klux Klan and the National Socialist Movement have been using for years. So as much as he may uh, say otherwise, the, the policies that he enacts, which include uh, atrocious things like deporting 10-year-old girls in the hospital who are there for surgery uh, back to Mexico. That, that's the kind of stuff that white supremacists like to see. And, and I think that they really believe they have an ally in the White House. Mm -hmm. but do, so do you think Trump has a thing for those kind of groups? I mean, he refused to specifically shame the white supremacists for the violence in Charlottesville where an anti-racist protester was killed. Media took that as Trump supporting the far right. Do you see that way as well? Or is it a little far-fetched to say that? Well, judging from President Trump's actions, he's, he's very quick to condemn football players for peacefully protesting, and he calls them sons of bitches and says they should be fired, like within hours of them protesting. But when neo-Nazis and Ku Klux Klan members are marching under swastikas in an American city and somebody gets killed, it, it takes him days to respond to that. I think that speaks volumes for uh, how he feels about these situations. I, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I'm just going by what he says and does. Well, he doesn't really say much, but like his actions, the way he didn't say anything or shame the white supremacists that, that day, uh, does, do you feel like he's, he has an inner affiliation with those people? Like he feels the same way they do? 
or maybe she counts on their support. Who knows? Right. I, I honestly, I, I feel that uh, President Trump has some severe psychological issues that, that have not been dealt with. His actions are, are those of somebody who has a, a very drastic insecurity complex. Uh, he seems to just be looking for whatever phrase he can get, and he doesn't care where that phrase comes from. So I... I think he's well aware that uh, white supremacists are fans of his, and, and I do believe that he, he doesn't want to uh, lose their support. And, and that it could be a reason why it takes him so long to condemn uh, neo-Nazi groups, whereas he has no problem condemning uh, b football players of color who, who want to make a statement. Well, uh, in all fairness, right after Charlottesville, he did sign a resolution condemning hate groups that espouse racism, extremism, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, white supremacy. So you feel like he maybe has one thing on a paper and another in his head? I, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to say where he's at because he's been very erratic. Uh, throughout this, the, the early days of his presidency, and, and he's uh, been all over the place. Um, his, his cabinet has, has complained numerous times about his tweeting. Uh, the, the people around him wish they could get more of a handle on him, and obviously he refuses to do that. So it, it's, yeah, he's, he's all over the place. And, and I, I know that he has publicly condemned hate groups, and, and, uh, that's fine, but when you condemn hate groups and then you enact legislation that uh, deports families just because they're the wrong skin color or uh, they came from Mexico, I, I don't think he's really busy deporting people who came from uh, Eastern Europe or people who came from Canada. It seems that, that all of his actions are, are focused on people with uh, darker skin. So when all that happened in Charlottesville, Trump blamed both the right and the left for clashes. Uh, you also felt some animosity towards yourself from the left, right? Are Antifa and other similar movements becoming a part of the radicalization problem? I, I, th that's one issue where I, I, I do uh, see President Trump's point, and I have also been uh, very frank about my condemnation of the far left and the Antifa groups. I do believe that they are a part of this problem. I think the fact that uh, the Unite the Right rally could count on a brawl from the Antifa really helped swell their membership. I recall in my days as a white supremacist, uh, we would drive six hours sometimes to go and fight Antifa. So it, the, the violent resistance that Antifa presents to uh, neo-Nazis does nothing but serve their purpose. And it also drives people from the political center further right. I, I think Charlottesville was instigated by the far right. That needs to be front and center. That needs to be acknowledged. But the, the far left certainly played their part in that melee. And uh, unfortunately, they, I, they'll continue to do that. So the far right and white supremacist groups claim that they are a reaction to movements like Black Lives Matter, to the new, loud, and somewhat radical civil rights groups. Do they have a point to stand against them? Yeah, I, I think the, the more radical that uh, leftist groups become and the more they emerge themselves in identity politics, the easier it is for the far right to recruit. Uh, there's been leaders of the alt-right who make no bones about the fact that they do identity politics for white people. And in our universities in the United States and in Europe, uh, basically, if you're a white kid, you can either confess your privilege and condemn your whiteness and, and kowtow to how, what you have to do to be an ally to people of color and anyone else who's oppressed, or you go off to the alt-right. There's really no middle ground for, for anyone to exist in anymore. And I, that, I believe that that is largely because of the uh, militancy of, of these self-proclaimed radicals on the left. So what they're doing does serve the purpose of the far right and vice versa. Every time the far right rears their heads, the left goes, oh, see, that's why we need to do what we do and we're going to double down on it and, and it becomes a cycle and they both kind of feed each other while most uh, people in society who just want to live their lives are, are kind of caught in the middle. You know, I also heard that several universities um, in the U.S. have been offering housing and creating learning communities for black students only. 
like California State and the University of Connecticut. They've explained this um, down to, to the need to actually create safe environments for students of color. What is that supposed to mean? Is this the comeback of segregation? I, I'm not a, a fan of that approach. I understand the reasoning behind it, but uh, to me, it really, it, it takes agency away from black students. It's, it's saying that uh, you don't have um, the ability to exist in this society and have a voice in the society and determine your own future. So here, we're gonna create this little safe space for you where you're not gonna be subject to white supremacy and it's done under this guise of compassion, but what it really boils down to is separatism. And it, it doesn't serve the students of color that they're working with, and it certainly doesn't help uh, to mend any of the, the wounds in our society that we're, we're definitely still reeling from after 500 years of white supremacy. I truly believe, and I've seen this in person many, many times over the past eight years as I've been working in peace building efforts, is that people have every capability to come and connect and recognize each other outside of the construct of race, outside of other social constructs, and, and have the ability to define their relationships about how they see other people. When we retreat and say, oh, I can't be safe unless I'm around people who think like me, look like me, act like me, you're, you're, you're essentially going back to the same mindset that the neo-Nazis have. And you're just uh, setting up a different camp. And, and I don't think that's ever a healthy thing for human beings. And I don't think it's going to help anybody on these colleges. All right, we're going to take a short break right now. When we're